in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you don't have a copy of the Scripture with you tonight, there are plenty of Bibles around the room under the chair racks or the black book. And uh, there, there are plenty available for you. Or you could just look around to someone near you and say, can I have your Bible, please? And uh, it would be impolite for them to say no. So maybe try, try that as well. Uh, matter of fact, that's what I'd do uh, if I didn't have my Bible. And then I'd look at the person... Like, why don't you have a Bible, you know? But uh, this is a Bible-preaching church. And, and you know something? Uh, it is less and less of a distinctive of churches that, hey, we teach the Word of God. And this is a book that's our authority. Last Tuesday evening, we were out doing soul winning. Uh, we were passing out door hangers. And on our door hanger, just a little phrase where God's Word is magnified above all. And then... It, I think it was on one of our distinctives that we believe in Bible authority. A uh, man's like, wow, a church that's like about the Bible. And he came Wednesday night, last yeah. Wednesday night. He said, well, that's what I'm looking for. A church that uh, teaches and preaches the Bible. And you know, it's really interesting. Every church does have a personality. And it has uh, characteristics. A lot of times it's just a personality. It's a lot like the people that are in the church. But uh, it's sad, I think, how little... Uh, the emphasis of this is what our church is, this is how we're defined, is around the, we teach the Word of God. And we help people to know the Scripture. Amen. And so, you know, sometimes though, when you teach the Word of God, sometimes you, you cover topics and matters that are uh, ones, I'll be honest with you, sometimes sermons that you just wish you didn't have to preach or portions of the Bible that you uh, don't want to preach. I'll be honest with you, I, I don't ever want to preach Song of Solomon. I have a couple of times, but it's just not comfortable material for me to cover. And so some of y'all are smiling like, oh, I love Solomon, Song of Solomon. I wish it weren't inspired, to be frank with you. I mean, if it were left out of the canon, I'd be fine with it. Now, I, seriously, all Scripture is profitable, and Song of Solomon is. And there's deep doctrine in Song of Solomon. But that's just a toughie for me. It's not one of those ones that I want to preach. Uh, this is a similar passage of Scripture we're in. Actually, this evening, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. The truth of the matter is, is that what we're going to look at this evening, this, there's great clarity in the Scripture on. There's not any ambiguity in it. It's a lot of detail. And because of the clarity, it's one of those things that anchors you in a biblical position. And frankly, uh, many believers don't believe what the Bible says about the matter of marriage and singleness. And so because of that, uh, it's one of those ones that I know when I preach it, I know I'm going to get the faces, you know, the looks. And it's kind of a small crowd this evening. You make a face. I'm going to stick out my tongue going, nan, nan, if you make a face at me this evening. But the reality of it is, is that uh, over the years, believing what the Word of God says in this, along with other portions of the Scriptures, there have been many individuals who made the decision not to come to our church simply because we believe what the Bible says. But that is, that's our definition. We believe in Bible authority. And if God says it, God's right, by the way. Amen. And uh, I'm not going to apologize. I can joke about it. I don't like preaching through Song of Solomon. Or this is not a necessarily a portion of Scripture that I enjoy preaching. But the reality of it is, is that God's way is the only way. And God's way is the only way that works. And the reason that the statistics inside the church house are similar to what they are in the world is because believers don't believe God knows anything. They think God's wrong about things. And He isn't ever. He made us, He created us, and if you will this evening, uh, do yourself the favor and uh, be honest enough just to say, you know, I'm going to just have an open Bible and an open mind and let God's Word speak to me this evening. Uh, there won't be any ambiguity in the, in the text tonight. And if you'll do yourself the favor of saying whatever God says I'll do, then this portion of Scripture can be extremely profitable for you and you can be a help to others as well. Now, let's just read tonight. I just want to read verses 1 and 2 of chapter 7, and we will actually cover a great deal of chapter 7 because it's a long flow of thought, but it's where we're at. I want to read verses 1 and 2, and then I just want to ask the Lord uh, for help tonight. Now, concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Now, Father, please help us tonight as we continue in this portion of the Scripture. And God, I just pray that nothing would be said 
that's extra that doesn't need to be said. And I pray as well, God, that everything that would be need to be said in order to settle our hearts and our minds and give us a biblical position on the matter of singleness would be said and uh, clearly stated from the Word of God. Now, I thank you for what you'll do. We trust your spirit for that and the work that we cannot do without you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 5, 6, 7 of 1 Corinthians. If you're outlining and you're just looking at content, 5, 6, and 7 all belong together. Same uh, group of material. And it's, it's one of the things, if you're looking at this letter that the Apostle Paul's writing to a church that he loved very much and had invested personally more of his time in than any other church, it's one of those things that you realize this letter is to a divided church, to a church that's divided because of people that have multiple problems. Every one of the problems could be boiled down to a three-letter word, the word sin. And so we looked at the sin of being unspiritual, and that's what it really was when some of the people in the church said, I'm of Paul, I'm of Paulus, I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. And they were divided about around individuals and following individuals and not following other individuals. The reason that they were following and looking at men this way was because they were unspiritual. That was the diagnostic for that problem. And so uh, Paul's solution ultimately was it's a spiritual problem and ultimately he implored them uh, to receive him as an apostle and as a father. He said, though you have 10,000 teachers, yet you have not many fathers. And he said, I have invested in you and you need to respond to my ministry. If an individual rec uh, uh, rejected the ministry of a valid apostle, who were they rejecting ultimately? Christ. In other words, if God gave you the apostle Paul and you said, I don't like him, I don't want him, not going to have him. Well, then who are you rejecting? It isn't Paul you're rejecting, it's Jesus. And so Paul really boiled that down and, uh, and, and boiled it down to a matter of carnality instead of spirituality and defended uh, his apostleship and told them the right way to follow him. Now, the portion of Scripture we're in uses a word that if you're studying uh, the Scripture carefully and you're asking, what are some recurring themes? in the part of the Scripture we're in right now, the recurring theme is the matter of fornication. If you'll study the word fornication in the Scripture, it is not used as much in the whole of Scripture as it is in chapters 5, 6, and 7 of 1 Corinthians. And so, if you're just being honest and saying, what is the Scripture talking about? It's a matter of perversion or sexual sin or uh, the matter of pornography or the, the uh, manifestation of that. And if you go back, as we did when we started, uh, so far we've seen two responses to fornication. The first response to fornication was flee fornication. <clears throat> flee fornication. Joseph's the example for that, to flee fornication. You say, how do I flee fornication? You cut and run. You leave anything, that'll hold you back. And that's the way you uh, uh, flee fornication, and that's the response. You know, believers say, Pastor, you don't understand the world in which we live. I'm telling you, it is so pervasive. You cannot drive down the street. You cannot go down the interstate without having uh, pornography just in your face. My friend, it's true. I have said many times to individuals that it is not a matter of whether or not you're affected by pornography. It's the degree to which you're affected by it. Of course, when I preach about pornography, I'm not saying, okay, so anyone here has struggled with pornography, this message is for you. When I preach about pornography, I say this message is for you. Period. Amen. It, it is. And you know, I think sometimes because it's such a... It is, it is one of, in the New Testament of the Scripture, one of the major sins where, you know, we're not under the law, but avoid fornication. When in the Acts church, the apostles went back to Jerusalem to ask the question about the Judaizers, what are Gentiles required to do? The response is, they don't have to be circumcised, they're not under the law, but fornication and meat offered to idols and things strangled, don't touch it. And that's over and over and over and over again in the New Testament of the Scripture. Amen. It's interesting. You know, what commands are there? Well, love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. When Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross in John chapter 13, He told the disciples, He said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. You boil down New Testament commandments, my friend, you can count them up on your, on your two hands. 
Fornication is the one that's mentioned the most often. It's interesting, isn't it? It's a big deal. And so when you start studying the Scripture, you say, okay, so the Scripture here emphasizes a whole lot about fornication. It has a lot to say about it right here. Why is it such a big deal? Let's look at the rest of the Scripture. You go back to the first instance. If you were to go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 21, or 21 and verse 11, you would see that when Jehoshaphat deliberately turned Judah away from God, he set up high places, alternative places of worship, and fornication. And if you are going to the secular world or you just go into secular history and look at religious history, which I call all secular, if it's not worship of God, it's not, it's not spiritual, it's not religious history, it's not church history for sure, uh, you'll study extra-biblical extra history, you will see that every false religion incorporates fornication. Every idol has fornication, has prostitution or some type of uh, homosexual or heterosexual perversion as part of its worship. Right. The major world religions, they are fornication-centered. Islam. If you would invest the time, I don't necessarily recommend that you do, but if you were to invest the time to read the Quran or the Hadiths, you would see particularly in the Hadiths, the individuals who wrote for the illiterate Muhammad wrote down what he said, you'll notice that 90% or more of what he talked about was just perversion. It's perversion. He was a pervert. He was a deviant, perverted pedophile. And uh, that is what the establishment of the religion is on. Check out Mormonism. Investigate Charles Taze Russell. And what I'm saying to you, I'm not making up. I know it's offensive because we're so politically correct, we're not supposed to speak out against evil. But the reality of it is, is that fornication is the number one tool of Satan in false religion, in false worship. It's a big deal. And God hates it. And so we as believers need to have victory over it. We also saw uh, the effect of, of uh, fornication. We saw uh, that it has, it's not only linked to idolatry, but it has an internal spiritual effect. In other words, chapter 6, the Scripture plainly stated that every sin that a man does is without the body, except for a person that commits fornication. It's in the body. It's an internal sin. It's something that affects you internally, messes with your mind, messes with you mentally. I don't have to be a psychologist or a psychiatrist and go, Woo! I can't believe that it corroborates the Scripture to tell you that, that pornography messes up the mind. It destroys the function of the brain. It has physical effect, and that is precisely what the Scripture is saying. It has a spiritual, emotional, physical effect. And so, Christian believer, it's a big deal. Now, the response to fornication is not by it's such a big deal and it's so pervasive and it's such a problem. I don't know what I can do about it. Maybe I'll just continue as I am. No, the response is God wants us to have victory. And so the first way to have victory is to flee, and the second way is to avoid it. And we uh, looked at that last week. But then we're left with the question, okay, the response, okay, to flee fornication, God just does whatever's necessary and gets away from it. And the second response to fornication, to avoid fornication, in chapter 7 is to get married. Now, we have an old wives' tale in uh, the church that says, you know, if you're struggling with fornication, marriage won't change anything. Well, I, am, I understand and to a degree I agree with that statement. But let me just tell you something. The Scripture plainly says that an individual who uh, has God-given desires that cannot be fulfilled any other way, uh, the Bible says that marriage is the way. And... Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, the Bible says marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. And there is no fornication in marriage, period. And that's a way to avoid fornication. You say, well, I just I have desires. Okay, so I want to look this evening, though, at the marriage option. Because we'll see in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that you have two options for fleeing fornication, or for avoiding, for, or not, not committing fornication, I should say. Fleeing and avoiding. Marriage is the avoiding option, and I just want to look at it in detail from chapter 7 because the Scripture has a lot to say about it, and it is it's not only insightful, it's really helpful. Okay? So, uh, fleeing fornication, you know, as we said, is, is, is as simple as, as what Joseph uh, did when he fled. Uh, but I want to look at the, in the, I want to look at the second option. I want to ask the question: 
Should I marry, or is it best to remain single? Now, the already marrieds, the Scripture gives some answers for you as well. How for you to avoid fornication, it's there. Uh, and so, the, the Scripture plainly delineates what God wants and what our options are. I want to say, though, uh, just a couple of things. If you just have bullet points, you're taking notes this evening, uh, and you say, Pastor, you made any points yet? No, I haven't. I haven't started my message yet. That's all introduction. <laughs> Uh, uh, so I want to just give you some, some bullet points, if you will. Uh, so first, it's important to note that fornication is not an option in the case that marriage is impossible. So before we get into you know marriage and should I marry or should I not marry in order to avoid fornication, okay, so I'm so ugly, no one will marry me. Well, you can't fornicate anyway. Okay. Uh, you understand? Some people think, well, you know, one or two, well, what, A, B, it must be C or D. No, there's no C, D, E, F, and G. The Scripture gives us two options, flee or avoid. You say, well, I can't get married. Well, then avoid <laughs> or flee fornication. I want to just, just state that at the outset. You say, Pastor, I, you know, I'm not sure I like where you're going with that. Well, it doesn't matter if you like it or not. That's the, the options the Scripture gives us, flee or avoid. Okay? And so I want us to notice that. Um, the reasons for marriage we're going to look at, uh, the reason for marriage is in order to not burn. Look at verse 9, will you please? Uh, Paul simply puts, or simply says, is if they cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. Okay, so if you make the decision, I'm going to go down the marriage route instead of the fleeing route. In other words, I have desires, and instead of fleeing and just... Those desires are never fulfilled in a right way. Uh, I'm just going to flee. Instead of that, well, then marriage is an option, and the burning or that desire in marriage is an option. And so uh, the, I also want to say, here's another bullet point, if you will, that being single is defined within 1 Corinthians chapter 7 as being a virgin or a widow. As a virgin or a widow, I read an article last week on 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and I just thought, how in the world can anyone mishandle Scripture so terribly? Start out with it. Well, you know, uh, you know, if you get divorced, remarriage is always an option. That's basically the way the article started off. You know, and the Bible has some remarriage isn't an option. So I want us to understand this evening that separation and remarriage in the Scripture are always separate issues. Sometimes there is a straw man that is put up when you hold to what the Scripture says about adultery, which is being married to someone while your spouse is living. Uh, there are individuals that throw the straw man up and say, well, you're saying divorce is, is not an option. No, I will say God hates divorce. I'll say, you know, that isn't the first option. Sometimes it is. Sometimes at least separation is something that's unavoidable. And the idea, you know, is to paint the person who would say God has an opinion about this, and here it is, is to say, well, that, that opinion is just intolerant of anything, and then just, just blanket statement, do away with what the Word of God plainly says. And friend, the Scripture's clear. It's evidently written. Uh, it's not popular for believers. Uh, I, I'll be honest with you. Uh, it's, it is heartbreaking to see how often individuals are recycled as though fornication is not fornication as long as you have a piece of paper in other words get rid of your spouse get another one as long as you marry it's okay as long as you marry it's okay as long as you marry it's okay as long as you just over and over and over again and every time you know if, if the, per the individuals are going to say well, we're going to be careful and do it the right way and make sure that the divorce was for the right reasons you know, then always, in, even in the church house, then it was because of adultery or it was because of an unbelieving spouse. The Scripture deals with unbelieving spouses here and with departing here. And the Scripture is very, very clear about that. So let's look at marriage options first of all this evening. Don't tune me out. Uh, tune in and look at what the Scripture says and follow the flow of the text. And the Scripture is very, very, very plain about what it says. Verse 8. Paul said, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows. Okay, do you see the classification of single people there? Unmarried and widows. You say, well, pastor, someone's divorced 
is not married. Well, what were they before they were divorced? Right? You want to play that? You want to go down that route? You want to play that game? Five a week, seven a week? How many marriages? In other words, it, 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 that's not what the scripture. Uh, the scripture is not being ambiguous here. It's sort of like uh, when mom or dad say, "Do not" or "Do." And then you talk about, well, you didn't say I couldn't, something else. Well, the Scripture is really saying what it's saying here. And Paul here is addressing marriage for the unmarried and the widows. And he's not addressing uh, those that are separated. He's addressing, they're going to be addressed later. They're not mentioned at this point. He said it's good for them if they abide even as I. Okay, so the first option uh, with regard to the consideration, should I marry or not, Paul said it's great if you don't. It's great if you don't. You don't have to marry. See, Luke? You're fine, bud. Don't you marry a mean girl. Don't you make the old girl tell you you have to marry her. No, I don't have to. It's good to remain, even as I. And Paul is obviously indicating uh, that he is, you know, he's at least, yeah, that he's not married. Um, then the second option this evening, and we, we, by the way, that's we'll see that again in this under single options. I just want to mention it. But the second option for a person who is single, yeah, and you say, okay, put yourself in a category. If you're married, these are my options. Uh, and if you're single, here are my options. So the second option for a person who is married is to remain married. Okay, so you say, well, I'm not single tonight. I'm married. Let's just go ahead and let's figure this out tonight. You know, we, we do this on Sunday mornings when we do the he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Everybody got ears? Okay, you're the one that needs to listen. Okay, let's just go ahead and figure out which category you are tonight so there's clarity. We don't have any trans marriage, I don't think, this oh, evening. Gosh. So the reality of it is you're either married or you're not, okay? This evening, let's just, all right. Who's married? Okay, who's unmarried? Amen. Okay, <laughs> so there's clarity there, right? Right? You know which category. Okay, so right now, you may be single, and you have the option, possibly, of fitting into this married category. So you could fit in this category. So the Scripture could apply to you here tonight, but it definitely does apply to you tonight if you're married. In other words, this is to, we're talking to married people right now. Okay, under the married, I command. So this is a commandment. Uh, yet not I, but the Lord. Now, Paul does delineate between his suggestions... Uh, which are inspired, and uh, between, this is not an option. Yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. Okay, so option number one, you're married, stay married. Now, <laughs> you say, Pastor, uh, you know, it's, that just, that's not too you know, deep, I don't think. Good! I'm glad you understand that. Someday, if you want to get unmarried, I'll remind you about it. Okay? I'm glad you understand it. Uh, let not the wife depart from her husband. So you don't have to, if you're married, you can stay married. That's an option. Um, verse 11, and if, but and if she depart, let her remain unmarried. Okay? So if a wife departs from her husband, is that, does that happen? Sure. Yes. Is it an option? That's not that well. Is it an option? No. Well, the Bible says it's an option. Okay, why well, you can leave your husbands? Okay, but you can't get another one. Uh, no. Now let me let's talk about this in just a minute. Last week when we were looking at the text where the Bible talks about uh, consent for a while, this could fit here. This could fit. Defraud not one another. You know, the notion that the physical relationship in marriage is the only thing there is in marriage is nonsense. And if that's why you're getting married, uh, well, people do get married for that reason. Actually, I've met Christians. I think that that's the motivating factor behind why they get married is they just want the physical relationship. And it's just going to be rough for you, friend. It's just going to be a tough road for you, and you're going you're gonna to pay dearly uh, for, for your desires. I've met individuals. I, I'm not going to be single. I can't be single, and they get married. And uh, it's, it's not because, you know, God's put the two of us together. Well, when you're married, that's what it's supposed to be. But that's not why they got married. It's because, you know, I want this option. And so let me just warn you, that's very, very dangerous. But is it an option for there to be consent, to separate? 
You know what? I think it's just as dumb as anything, but you ever read the journals of John Wesley? There are a lot of evangelists. I just think, why'd you marry? I just think, why'd you get married? You got married and you left your wife at home and you go off, you see her about every couple of years. Or what, what, what did you marry for? And then you read sometimes their wives' journals and, and their articles and you realize, okay, they were fine with that. That was consent. In other words, they determined that. Now, we seem to understand here that this is a permanent departure. But there can be a temporary departure or a permanent departure, and the temporary departure uh, would come back with reconciliation. In other words, the Bible says, uh, if she depart, verse 11, let her remain unmarried. By the way, that's a hortatory subjunctive. It's not saying it's an option for her to remain unmarried. It's saying you let her be unmarried, and that's the only option. It's a command. Paul's commanding here. He's not, he's not suggesting. And in the language, this is not a suggestion. This is not like we would use in our modern day language where let means permission or allow. It's more than that. In the construction, the grammatical construction, it is a you let. Okay, so now let me just ask you, if you don't believe or you don't understand what I'm talking about this evening, let's just put it, everybody here pretty much have mothers. Okay. Uh, if not, just imagine someone that would do it the same way. Okay, so most of us have mothers or had them at some point in time. When your mother says, you let him alone, or you let go of me, is she saying, you know, there's a possibility, uh, or an option at least. Uh, I just want to give you a range of options. Let go of me, you know, and that's, that's an option for you. Is that why she's telling you let go of me or you let go of me? Is that what she's saying? No, she's using the auditory subjunctive. In other words, you're going to die, or you're going to have serious pain, or you will remember for the rest of your life that you for you 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 uh, passed over the opportunity to let me go before you died, or it had serious consequences. Uh, for you Samson, when someone says you put that down, you know, you don't touch that. Are they asking you politely, uh, you know, to exercise an option? Let that go, and you'll be like, well, or not. Huh. Right? No, they understood you there. That's In our language, that's the closest thing we have to the hortatory subjunctive, which is what the Scripture is using here. And it is in the construction. It's not, a, well, this could be a hortatory subjunctive. It is. That's, what, that's the case it's written in, and that's the only way it can be interpreted or translated. And so, let not the wife or the husband put away his wife. Okay? But there's an option in verse 11 for a married person to be reconciled. If she depart, let her remain un unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. So here's another option for a married person. A married person can be reconciled to their spouse. Let's play some word games, shall we? Or let's play some semantical games, which people like to do here. Um, pastor, to put away is to divorce. Yeah. And... And when you're divorced, you're not married anymore. Yeah. Okay. Then how do you reconcile to your husband or to your wife? How are they a husband or a wife? You want to play that game? I heard a preacher preach a whole sermon about how that divorced people aren't married because the very term divorce means you're not married. Well, then how do you reconcile to a husband or a wife? Do you know the Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God? Those words are there. Wife's there. Husband's there with departed spouses. Unmarried is there. And yet, wife and spouse is still there. You still have a wife, you still have a spouse. You say, Pastor, what if you're remarried? Well, you've got multiples. You're a polygamist. You say, Pastor, not very nice. I don't like that you said that. I don't like saying it, to be frank with you. It'd be a lot nicer if, if it wasn't that way. Well, what if, what if God's forgiven me? Well, if you've repented and God's forgiven you, you are absolutely forgiven. That's what if. God forgives. But it is what it is. You know, glossing it over and not teaching our children is just creating an animal of recurrence. It just goes over and over, and it's a cycle. It just continues and continues and continues over and over again. And uh, it certainly is uh, a truth that a child does not have to eat sour grapes. His teeth don't have to be set on edge because his parents' teeth, or because his father ate sour grapes. But it's also true that children are likely to continue in the sins of their fathers. You don't have to, but it's likely you will. And we bear responsibility for being truthful and telling people what sin is. 
what options are for an alternative to it. Okay, now, uh, the third option is, of course, the one we mentioned, which is uh, before, but it's to stay married to an unbelieving spouse. Okay, so what if, well, pastor, my spouse is not a believer. Well, you have an option to separate from, verse 12. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. Remember context here. The Bible says in, in our context, chapter 6, this is where we see uh, that a believer is not to be yoked together with an unbeliever. So you're yoked together with an unbeliever. You're not supposed to be, but you're married. And marriage is valid. A believer and an unbeliever. I say to people all the time, uh, if marriage were invalid between two unbelievers, I've heard Christians argue this one, it's okay to divorce somebody, and you're not under the law, you're not under the da 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 make up all these things. You can get remarried as long as your spouse is an unbeliever. Uh, does that mean that every lost person who's married is actually not married? Is every lost person who has recognized the covenant of marriage, any person who gets married recognizes God's covenant of marriage, lost or saved? Does that mean that any lost person who, uh, they're not born again, so actually they're living together in fornication? Baloney. They're married. Isn't it so? Yeah. Okay, so the Bible says here, though, if you're married to an unbeliever, well, you're not supposed to have gotten married, but you're married. And so you're married to an unbeliever. Maybe you got saved. Your spouse is an unbeliever. And the Bible says, if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. In other words, if your unbelieving spouse wants to live with you being a Christian, then let her not. Again, that's the auditory subjunctive. You're not allowed to leave him. He's an unbeliever. I'm allowed to leave him. No, if he is willing to stay married to you, you can stay married to him or you're supposed to stay married to him. That's the idea. If he is willing to stay married to you, you're supposed to stay married to him. The Scripture is so frequently misapplied and yet it's so plainly scripturally written. That's what the Bible says. Okay, my, my, my wife's not saved. I got saved and she didn't or I was saved and I shouldn't have married her and did. Uh, well, if she leaves you, you don't really have anything to say about that. But if you want to play the uh, I'm a pious, faithful Christian and I'm going to leave my spouse even though they want to stay together, you're playing a game, my friend. And the Scripture's evident that it's a game. It's not right. Uh, it might, might, I, would, I was married to an unbeliever. Well, if they leave you, you're not going to be judged for them leaving you. But again, what does the Scripture say? Let not the husband put away his wife, and the wife is to remain unmarried. They're supposed to remain unmarried. Uh, in verse 14, the unbelieving husband sanctified by the wife. The unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Ron Riley uh, has an interesting observation. He used to have a youth group of uh, literally hundreds of kids. He's worked with youth for years and years and years. And he talks about teenagers and teenagers turning out well. You know, you ever seen kids and they just don't turn out well? Uh, they come from maybe a good church or what you think is a good home and they just don't turn out well. And uh, I, Bill Rice told me this, actually. He said, you know, Ron Riley had said this. He said, if... A kid has two parents that are together, and one parent doesn't love the Lord. Most of the time, the teenager's going to go into the world. He said, if a parent has a kid has two parents that are together, and uh, both of them love the Lord, the kid's probably going to turn out well. And he said, if a kid has two parents and they're not together, and one's saved and one's lost, he said, uh, usually the kid turns out well. I said it the wrong way. I said if they're not together, but then I, the other one is if they are together. And I believe there's an application here of the Scripture. Right? And that's, that's Ron Riley's statistics of his youth group. right? And that's just statistics. That's not inspired. But I believe there's something here to the unbelieving husband sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the believing husband. I've just seen some kids just grow up in circumstances where it just, God just they just turn out great. They, they have a parent that doesn't love the Lord or isn't born again. And, uh, you know, that's an important consideration. Uh, and again, those aren't rules. You can turn out just fine because uh, you answer to God for yourself regardless of what your circumstances are. Okay, so a, a quick summary here 
is that the best option for a married individual is to remain in marriage. Would we agree this evening that's what the force of the text is here? The best option for a married person is to stay married. Uh, divorce and remarriage are separate matters altogether. Do we agree about that this evening? They're, they're not the same issue. It's a different issue. Remarriage is separate from uh, separation. <laughs> okay. Uh, to say that separation or departure is not an option confuses the matter. Makes it confusing, doesn't it? Uh, you know, you can't get divorced under any circumstance. That makes it really, that makes the whole issue confusing because the scripture gives circumstances where separation's an option. Okay? Uh, to argue that a married person is single, uh, as in a virgin or a widow, it, it, the same as a virgin or a widow, is unsupported in this text. Can we agree on that? To say, a person who's divorced is the same as a person who's a virgin or a person who's unmarried, because those are the classifications for single that are discussed in our, in our context. Study it carefully if, if you haven't caught that. It's really, really carefully delineated in the Scripture. And to say that a person who's divorced is now single in the same way that a person who is a virgin and has never married or a person who's a widow, because the Bible says a widow is not under the law. She is free to remarry. A widow is. And the scripture plainly lays that out. Okay. Uh, and then the last thing that is that reconciliation and separation are the two options for a person who has departed or has been departed from. Okay. So you've been separated, your spouse departed from you, or you departed from your spouse. There are two options reconciliation or continued separation. You can stay separate. You don't have to. You, Pastor, what if a man's abusive? You should never be in an abusive relationship. What if there are disgusting things that you're being subjected to in that home? You shouldn't be in a place where you're subjected to disgusting things. I have recommended to married couples, you know, you need to separate. I've told mothers, if you stay in that home, your kids are going to be taken from you. You can't be in a home where your husband's doing drugs. You get out of there. And you know what happens usually when she leaves? He calls me. And I say, I'd like to help you with your drug problem. He wouldn't do a thing about it while she stayed. But when she left and took the kids, he said, okay, I got a problem. He usually starts by cursing me out, threatening to kill me. And then the next phone call is, you know, okay, I got a problem. God's way works. It really does. And there are, there are right times, there are right ways for separation. Biblical separation. There is biblical separation. You hear me tonight? I tragically have heard of scenarios and seen <laughs> scenarios where individuals would say, well, you just got, you married them, you got to stay in that abusive or that dangerous or that whatever situation, that toxic. You don't have to be in a toxic relationship. You don't have to. God has designed, that's part of church discipline. If they're a believer, God has built in church discipline and separation by a spouse until they get right is a way to help them get right. right. We as believers just need to embrace the Scripture. It's, it is, it's such a help. and it, it, I'll tell you something, doing things God's way simplifies. People's problems are complex, convoluted, and when they lay it all out, you're like, well, you've got a real mess. But then you can start and say, but you know what? If you just do right, you'd be amazed how the whole mess sorts itself. I don't know what to do about this and 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 this. Because they just got so many problems that are all the, from the same source, which is a simple sin. We'll deal with the sin and do right in every instance. And you'd be amazed at how problems really aren't a problem. Maybe it's a hard decision. Doing right's never easy. We mentioned that before. If doing right were the natural response, there'd be no discussion of right and wrong, would there? Doing right is difficult. It's oftentimes costly. It's oftentimes very, very uh, involves a lot of oppression and a lot. Of, it's just hard. But you know, doing right is also very simple. It's right, I'll do it, and then you'd be amazed at how all the complexity just goes away. Well, you know, I don't know whether I should be with this person. This we shouldn't be with either of them. It's amazing. There's people's messed up situations. Well, they're both wrong. Remove yourself. And all of a sudden, it's just not complicated anymore. Now I just deal with what's, what's left over. 
Okay, now let's finish up. Uh, non options for a person who has been married. Did I mention that? Uh, verse 11 if she depart, let her remain unmarried. Now go down to verse 39. Uh, the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she's at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. But she's happier if she is so abiding. Although she'll be happier if she doesn't get married, but uh, she's, she's fine uh, being married. So what are the non-options for a person who's been married? Well, if they're not a widow, the option uh, is to reconcile or to stay, stay alone. But the non-option is adultery, which is remarriage. It's not an option. It's, it's clear in the Scripture here. Uh, what are the single options? we got two of them. <laughs> As a single, listen to me. All right, let's do the, the check-in. And singles? we got singles here? Anybody here single? Okay, raise your hand. You're single? Okay. We're going to look at your two options. Your first option is to stay single. Amen. Stay single. Let's look at some verses. Verse 17. But God, as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all the churches. It's interesting when you look at this matter of calling here. It's the where you're at, what you are. How do you know tonight, if you're single, that you're called to be single? How do you know you ought to brush your teeth in the morning? <laughs> well, you either have them or you don't. If you don't have them, you shouldn't brush them. If you do, you should. Right? It's, it's one of those things that you know we want to help with clarity. Right? Uh, should you read your Bible in the morning? Yeah. Okay. So, Paul's suggestion to single people is if you're single, that's your calling. And he talks about it. If you're, if you're a slave or a servant, try and, don't try not to be a servant. You know, just be sure that you're really actually serving God, not man. And if you're free, don't try to be a servant. That's that. If you read down the text, the part we haven't read yet, that's what he discusses a lot of. Remain as you are. Stay as you are. So first option for a single person is to not get married. And in our conclusion, there's going to be a strong recommendation to that. I'm just going to tell you, I'm just going to recommend that to you. If you're single and you can stay single, take the flee route instead of the avoid route. It's just, you're going to end up the same ultimately. We're going to see that. But if you can stay single, then go ahead. That's what the Scripture says. Now, you say, Pastor, but I, you know, I don't know if I can. Well, marriage is an option. That's our next option. Let's look at verse 20, though. Let every man abide in the same calling where, wherein he was called. Are you called to be single? Singles, are you called to be single? Well, I don't know, Pastor. I'm not sure if I'm called to be single. Well, let me phrase it to you another way. Were you born married? <laughs> Some of y'all, yeah, my parents had betrothed me <laughs> before I was born. <laughs> yeah, okay, that didn't happen here, okay? So don't give me the could have happened scenario. All right, were you born married? Sometimes sarcasm helps a little bit, but it gives you a little bit of... Okay, so then, do you think you might have been called to be single if God had you be born single? In other words, let me just tell you something. If God wanted you to be married right now, you'd have been born married. Seriously. I'm being silly about it, but I'm also dead serious. Your call to be single, your permission, your urge or uh, in the Scripture, the suggestion that you remain single is based on the fact that you've been called to be single when you're born, and so just, you can remain. Go ahead. Paul said, if I had my way, if I had my druthers, you wouldn't marry. All right. <laughs> Pastor, the Muslims are taking over the world by populating like rabbits. We need to do the same thing. We need to marry and have 20 kids apiece. And that's how we're going to evangelize the world. How many of y'all, Pastor Rob, you met these people? You met the person? Have, have 20 kids and we're going to, the world's going to be saved. But, you know, there's, there's an alternative to that. Preach the gospel. <laughs> you don't have to have children to uh, convert the world. You won't, actually. That's Catholic. That's Muslim. 
They're born into your religion. You don't get born Baptist. You get born again, then you become a doctrinal Baptist if you hold to the Scripture. Baptist is a doctrine, not a denomination. So don't come at me with that one, okay? It's a neat concept. I like to joke about it, but in all seriousness, it's not a reason to marry. And you marry and have a lot of kids, and we're going to change the world by having a lot of kids. Try preaching the gospel. It'll make, it, it, it's, it has a great effect on people's lives, and you know because of what it did to you. Okay, so don't, <laughs> you know, sometimes we're just, not, we're just silly sometimes. The logic is when you analyze it, it's just like, that's just nuts. But I've met the people, and there are a lot of nuts in Christianity. You know why there's so many nuts in Christianity? Because there are a lot of nuts that got saved. Amen. You ever have somebody, well, you know, church is full of weird people. Yeah, I know, so's a supermarket. So's my block, my neighborhood. They're just weird people get saved, folks. And God's yeah. gracious unto all them that call yeah. upon Him. So you say, why are Christians so weird? Because weird people get saved. That's, That's why. Right. You know, it doesn't stop you from being weird. Uh, and so, uh, anyway, that's why we have some nutty concepts. And so well, that's free for you tonight just to think about. Brethren, let every man wherein is called therein abide with God. That's verse 24. Brethren, let every man wherein is called therein abide with God. My friend, you have God's permission to remain what you are. Well, I don't know if it's God's will for me to be married or not. Then stay single. That's it. I mean, obviously, if you don't know if it's God's will for you to be married or not, it isn't. And until you know it's God's will for you to be married, then you're called to be single. Yeah, just like that. You know something? I was called to be single till I met my wife. Fact. I was settled on 1 Corinthians 7 until I met my wife, and then I said, i got to marry her. Serious. It just, it just oh man, got to marry her. I'd settle. I was, oh, should I get married? Should I stay single? When I met my wife, this was settled. And that's when God gave me my wife. Before that, it's like, date a girl. I don't know. Date another girl. I don't know if I'm supposed to marry her or not. But when I got settled, I said, God, I will be single the rest of my life if that's what you want. And then when I settled that and said, God, and if you want me to marry someone, I'll marry whoever you want. Then God just gave me the whoever he wanted. Amen. And it was pretty marvelous. It was different than any other relationship I'd been in. I wish I'd just had somebody teach me that when I was a teenager. I wish somebody just shared that with me and said, you know, just stay single until God gives you the whoever. And unless you have clarity about it, it's just not. There, uh, there are people who are just desperate to be married. And uh, it, they're, they're taking the whole burn thing and running with it. And friend, it, that'll burn you, I promise you. All right, uh, verses 32 through 34. I would have you without carefulness. Paul said, I don't want you to be, you know, concerned over details or unclear. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Now, I've met single people that aren't okay being single, and it's because they don't care for the things of the Lord. That's why they're so frustrated by it. They're bothered by their loneliness. They're bothered by their singleness. And the reason they're bothered by it is because they just don't love the Lord. Just don't love the Lord. You love the Lord, you'd say, well, this is, life's great. Life's grand. Listen, you're never, God's never going to give you something when you're a griper. God doesn't give gripers anything. Well, here, let me give you something wonderful and you'll appreciate it. No, you don't appreciate what you have. You don't appreciate what God gives you. Amen. And so learn to appreciate singleness and to lose that carefulness and God might force you into marriage after that. Verse 34. There's a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman... Now, it's not saying a, a, a wife is not a virgin in the sense of purity or anything like that. But the unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. The fact of the matter is, I am a consideration for my wife. She feels led to serve the Lord in an area, and I am a consideration in that. And vice versa. You know, all the African guys that ask me to come to uh, all the African countries and preach every week, if I was single, I'm gone. <laughs> I'll be there. But the fact of the matter is I have two obligations, this church and my wife. Yes. And I can't just rock it off and go to Africa every week or India or Pakistan or wherever because I have duties and responsibilities. 
but a single person can. When I was single, when I had really settled this matter, I came down to the rice and beans uh, living. In other words, I decided I was graduating from, from college and I didn't have any, any, this is where I have to be in my life. And some of my plans had been subverted. And I just had come down to, man, all I need is rice and beans. That's all I need. I'm serious. I just said, I'm rice and beans. And so I put the word out. Anywhere, anybody needs somebody that wants to do ministry, I'm available. And all I need is, you know, is just a couch or a, you know, a hole or something and some rice and beans. And I can even get my own rice and beans. And I literally could go anywhere in the world and do anything. Nothing to tie me to. I didn't need anything. I had a couple vehicles. I could cancel the insurance and put them in my dad's shed and go serve the Lord. Man, was that a wonderful time in my life. My wife was on rice and beans too when I met her. And we were both just serving the Lord and then we saw that we could serve the Lord together. That's, that's the way to do it, folks. Uh, I speak This I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. Pastor, you ever going to be done? Yes. Single options, remain single and serving, or to marry in order to avoid fornication. Pastor, I can't avoid fornication. I have burning desires, and I, I have to be married. All right, well, you flee until you avoid. If you can't flee fornication, you won't avoid fornication. But you flee until you marry. You be pure and clean and right. You don't be, don't be, don't be succumbing to pornography. If you're into pornography, you're not qualified to marry. Amen. You flee until you avoid. And uh, couples ask. Guys ask, girl, you struggle with pornography? Are, are, do you have victory in that area of your life? How long you had victory before you get married? Ask that question. My wife asked me that question. It's a good question to ask. I asked her that question. Flee. And then, I mean, I've got to be married. We'll avoid fornication. You can do that. You have permission. And here's our conclusion uh, in the Scripture. It's not wrong or inferior to be married. Sometimes you have the way, you know, you, you, you succumb. You couldn't run, so you avoided. You know, loser. You know, we, runners are always more fit. You know, we're, they're, they're vegans or something. Who knows? But uh, they're better than everybody else. Uh, verse 17, As God distributed every man, as the Lord hath called everyone, so let him walk. So, you're called to be married, be married. You're called to be single, be, be single. You're not better because you're one or the other. And then there's one last thing to consider, and that is that ultimately, there's no giving of marriage in heaven. There's no giving of marriage in heaven. Making it to the grave faithful to the Lord is the right response for a believer. In other words, Pastor, what if I die and I have no children? Or what if, you know, well, what if you die and you have children? They're not yours. You might have children that are in hell. If you, if you marry the wrong person and end up in the wrong relationship, you might, you might have children that are in hell. Amen. You know, I, having children is not some kind of virtue. Being married is not some kind of virtue. It's not, oh, it's this level of Christianity. When you're in heaven, my, this is a tough one for me because my wife and I are best friends. And I hope we're allowed to be best friends in heaven. That's, that's I mean, I'll be okay. But it's hard for me to think about not being married to her. It's just a tough one for me to just wrap my mind around. But there's no marriage in heaven. And in verse uh, 29, Paul said, This I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. You see that? You say, Pastor, it's just so hard being single. Well, you won't live too long, so don't worry about it. <laughs> That's what the Scripture here is saying. Now, it's nice. Paul's nicer. The Holy Spirit's kinder. But sometimes you have to be blunt for people to get the point. Mm. Okay? And so, you know, you're not going to live that long, so don't worry about it. If you die single, you'll die the same way anyone else does. When you're in heaven, you'll be single. You had a marriage relationship. I'm going to tell you, when you die, it's over. It's over. It's done. The moment you die, you're not married anymore. The moment your spouse dies, you're not married anymore. A widow's not married. A widower's not married. Done. And that's a tough one for us. Married folks, it's hard. That's a hard one. You love your spouse, you just think about it. But it's just, that's just what the Bible says. And so let me just tell you something. You just got to make it. And if you've lived any amount of time, you know life is just 
what the Bible says. It's a vapor. And it, it just passes by. Pastor, what if you hadn't been married? Well, I honestly think if I hadn't met my wife, I'd be single, to be truthful with you. What if your wife died? Well, I honestly think that if my wife died, I'd, be, I'd just, you know, unless it just happened the way it happened with her, I'd just be single. I just wouldn't want to be married to anybody else. You say, well, you know, you change your tune when it happens. I realize all that. I've observed that. But the reality of it is I know what the Scripture says. Is you're not going to live that long. Life's not that long. It's not so terrible to not get married. Matter of fact, it isn't terrible at all to be unmarried. That's what the Bible says. It's not terrible to be unmarried. It's okay. Amen. It's just as good as being married, and the end result is the equivalent. We need to hear that as believers. Oh, we've got some cupids and matchmakers. You know, we're all hoping Charlie marries on the right day next year. But the reality of it is, is that it's okay if he doesn't. Well, it's, it's okay with some people if he doesn't. Well, okay. Anyway, that has nothing to do with it. <laughs> Folks, we just want to please the Lord, don't we? And it's been a long message this evening. From the resurrection, Jesus said to, to the Sadducees, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So if you're not married, tell people, leave you alone. Serve the Lord. Love the Lord. And if you are married, then stay married or reconcile or stay single. And that's what the Scripture says this evening. It's plainly written, and it'll really help you if you'd, you'll just apply it. Believe it. Father, thank you for what we learned this evening. And I pray that you'd help us. Lord, it is a hard message. And some of the things are stated in a hard way, not out of hardness of my heart or not out of anger, but God, just simply because these are just truths and they're, they're unbending. And I'm glad of that. You're right. And we agree with you tonight. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to have a fellowship uh, this evening. Normally we take prayer requests. And let's, let's go ahead and take some prayer requests and uh, then we'll have our fellowship at that uh, uh,